Welcome, everyone, to episode four of the Biologic Podcast, Remastered. Today, I'll be discussing a unique class of self-reproducing biopolymers called nucleic acids. Nucleic acids can, and most likely did, form in the hot, mineral-rich environments of the primordial Earth. They've been observed to form in places as inhospitable as deep-sea vents and volcanoes. It's largely believed that nucleic acids were the first self-reproducing molecules that bridged the gap between chemical evolution and biological evolution. If you recently listened to episode 3 about proteins, you should be familiar with the concept of polymers. Basically, a chain of monomers that are connected together into a larger structure. Now, just like polypeptides, nucleic acids are biopolymers. While the monomers in a polypeptide are called amino acids, the monomers in a nucleic acid are called nucleotides, or ribonucleotides. Ribo, as you probably noticed, is the prefix in ribonucleic acid, or RNA. DNA has a similar structure to RNA, except that DNA has two complementary strands, while RNA has one strand. And more specifically, DNA lacks the hydroxyl group bonded to its 2' prime carbon that RNA has. Because DNA lacks this oxygen atom, it carries the prefix 2-deoxyribo. DNA is thus the acronym for 2-deoxyribonucleic acid. Both types of nucleic acid share the nucleotides adenine, guanine, and cytosine. The fourth and the fifth nucleotides are used by only one type of nucleic acid each. You have the nucleotide uracil, which exists only in RNA, and you have the nucleotide thymine, which exists only in DNA. And when cells translate RNA to DNA, uracil and thymine are used as interchangeable replacements, or like translational analogs. So when RNA gets translated into DNA, all of those uracils in the RNA get translated into thymines. Now both RNA and DNA typically exist as relatively long, string-like molecules. Unlike sugar polymers, nucleic acids do not branch off of one another like the branches of a tree. Instead, they exist as strands or loops. In bacteria, for example, nucleic acids form millions of small loops of independently replicating DNA, called plasmids. Bacterial DNA doesn't really organize into the long strings and clumpy chromosomes that characterize eukaryotic DNA. Additionally, both endosymbiotes and complex life forms use circular loops of DNA. Mitochondria, the energy-producing structure that exists in the cells of all complex life, uses loops of DNA instead of chromosomes. Chloroplasts, which are an endosymbiote in plant cells that help them produce energy through photosynthesis, also uses loops of DNA. The eukaryotic cells that house mitochondria and chloroplasts, however, they use linear DNA molecules that do get wound up into dense chromosomes. Every nucleotide is composed of three basic parts. A 5-carbon pentose sugar, a phosphate group, and a nitrogenous base. The five-carbon sugar takes the form of a pentagon made from four carbon atoms and one oxygen atom. The fifth carbon atom is not in the pentagon itself. Instead, the fifth carbon is connected to a carbon atom in the pentagon that's immediately adjacent to the oxygen atom, so it just kind of juts sideways out of the ring. As you might be thinking, it's difficult to describe the positions of atoms within a ring in a way that isn't confusing or overly descriptive. To manage this problem, the atoms, usually just the carbon atoms in the ring, are numbered. The fifth carbon atom, the one poking up from the plane of the pentagon, is numbered 5, or 5 prime. The carbon atom that it bonds to is numbered 4, or 4 prime. Then you have carbon atoms 3 prime, and 2 prime, and 1 prime, and they compose the rest of the pentagon. Carbon 1 and 4 both sit on either side of the oxygen atom. Carbon 1 and 5, the ones sticking out of the pentagon ring, are both binding sites for the other parts of the nucleotide. 
the one prime carbon binds to the nitrogenous base, while the five prime carbon binds to the phosphate group. I covered the phosphate group uh, pretty briefly in episode two. It's a phosphate atom that shares five bonds with four oxygen atoms. As a result, some of these oxygen atoms carry a full negative charge, which makes the molecule as a whole very negatively charged. One of the oxygen atoms bound to the phosphate atom will get rid of its negative charge by binding to this five prime carbon. The one prime carbon, on the other hand, will bind to a small group of molecules called nitrogenous bases. These nitrogenous bases are molecules with one or two rings composed of carbon and nitrogen. With one exception, each nitrogenous base has one or two carbon atoms with a double bond to an oxygen atom. Now this nitrogenous base is like a little flake of organic matter poking out of the phosphate sugar backbone. It's heavy on the nitrogen, with some degree of variability. There's two groups of bases, called pyrimidines and purines. The pyrimidines are composed of a six-point ring, while purines are composed of two rings, basically a hexagon that shares a side with a pentagon. Recall the numbering system that I mentioned a few moments ago. This numbering system can be used on any ring of atoms, including these purines and these pyrimidines. Let's start with the pyrimidines, because their shape is somewhat simpler. Okay, so we have this hexagon, with points arranged at the top and bottom. This top point is a nitrogen atom, which we'll call 1 prime. This 1 prime nitrogen is the atom that binds to the 1 prime carbon of the ribose sugar. So just in the future, remember that this 1 prime nitrogen atom connects the nitrogenous base to the backbone. The rest of the nitrogenous base more or less extends outwards from this atom. Okay, so after starting at the top, the ring is numbered clockwise. The one prime atom is the nitrogen at the top, so the two prime atom, a carbon atom, is at the next clockwise point in the hexagon. The numbers continue in this direction. Three prime and four prime are carbon atoms. 5 prime is a nitrogen atom, and 6 prime, the last point in the hexagon before coming back to the top, is a carbon atom. In each pyrimidine, a double bond connects the 2 prime and 3 prime carbons in the ring. Now purines can be numbered in pretty much the same way. Except purines are composed of two rings instead of just one, so it's, it's a little more complex. So let's start with this hexagon that's numbered in the same way as the pyrimidine hexagon. The one prime atom at the top and the five prime atom on the lower left side are both nitrogen atoms. The two prime and three prime carbon atoms in the hexagon share a double bond, and both of these are also shared with the pentagon. The pentagon is attached to the right side of the hexagon. In somewhat mechanistic terms, this basically means that there's this three-atom bridge that loops out to form a second connection between the two and three prime carbon atoms. This bridge is also labeled in a clockwise fashion, starting with the first atom immediately adjacent to the two prime carbon. This first atom is labeled seven prime, followed by eight prime and then nine prime, and this then connects back to the three prime carbon in the hexagon. Three pairs of atoms within the purine's two-ring structure share double bonds. The six prime carbon and the one prime nitrogen, the two and three prime carbons, and the eight prime carbon and nine prime nitrogen atoms. The seven prime nitrogen in the purine is the atom that binds to the ribose sugar, as opposed to the one prime nitrogen in the pyrimidines. If you just came from listening to the third episode about proteins, uh, you should recall that polypeptide chains are composed of amino acids, which are distinguished from one another by their R-group side chains. In a similar way, these nucleotides are distinguished from one another by their nitrogenous bases. DNA molecules use four nucleotide bases, guanine, adenine, thymine, and cytosine. RNA uses the same bases, except it replaces thymine with a similar pyrimidine called uracil. Each nucleotide base can be referred to by the first letter of its name, G, T, A, C, and U. Guanine and adenine are both purines, while cytosine, thymine, and its RNA replacement uracil 
are all pyrimidines. So how do these nitrogenous bases vary from one another? What are their differences? Recall the numbering mechanism and the ring structures that I described a moment ago. Let's start with the purines. Guanine has an oxygen double bound to its 4 prime carbon, and an amino group bound to its 6 prime carbon. Adenine, the other purine base, only has an amino group bound to the 4 prime carbon. Now the three pyrimidines. You have cytosine, which has an amino group on its 4 prime carbon, and an oxygen double bound to its 6 prime carbon. The 5 prime nitrogen atom in cytosine doesn't have a hydrogen atom bound to it. Instead, it shares a double bond with the 4 prime carbon. The other two pyrimidines, thymine and uracil, both have a hydrogen atom bound to their 5 prime nitrogen atoms, and only one double bond between the 2 and 3 prime carbons. Thymine, the base that's used in DNA, has two oxygen atoms. Each of them are in a double bond, one to the 4 prime carbon and the other to the 6 prime carbon. Thymine also has a methyl group, and this methyl group is attached to its 3 prime carbon. Uracil, the base used in RNA, is remarkably similar to thymine, sharing every quality except that little methyl group. So if you just take that little methyl group off, you turn thymine into uracil. Because DNA is double-stranded, the bases fit together to form complementary pairs. Each pair consists of a purine and a pyrimidine base, which fit together with a few snug little hydrogen bonds. The bases in each pair connect like a puzzle piece, their physical geometries smoothly fitting together. Adenine and thymine, or A and T, they pair together, just as cytosine and guanine, C and G, also pair together. The AT connection has two hydrogen bonds, while the GC connection has three hydrogen bonds. This makes the GC connection slightly stronger than the AT connection. Long stretches of GC sequences in the DNA are thus harder to unzip, and they play a role in regulating DNA expression. I'll discuss all of this in greater detail in future episodes about DNA replication, transcription, and translation. So the nitrogenous bases, the subunits that identify the entire nucleotide, are the parts that are involved in information storage via coding and they're also responsible for holding the two DNA strands together with their hydrogen bonds. The other two subunits of the nucleotide, the 5-carbon sugar base and the phosphate group, they bind together to compose the backbone of the nucleic acid. Just like the amino and the carboxyl groups are involved in the polymerization of polypeptides, the phosphate group and the sugar are involved in the polymerization of nucleotides. The bonds that hold the nucleotides together in this polymer chain are called phosphodiester linkages. Phospho, because of the phosphate atom, and diester, because of the two esters in the linkage. In biochemistry, an ester is an oxygen atom that's bound to two non-hydrogen atoms, usually as some part of an alkyl group. In this phosphodiester linkage, the phosphate atom in the middle is bound to four oxygen atoms. One of them it's bound to with a double bond, and another it's bound to with a single bond, which gives that oxygen a negative charge. But the other two oxygens are connected on either side of the phosphate, forming the linkage. These two oxygen atoms are the esters, because each one binds to the phosphate atom in the middle and to a carbon molecule in adjacent nucleotides. So there you go, that's the phosphodiester linkage. Through these bonds, the repeating pattern of ribose sugars and phosphate groups composes the backbone of the nucleic acids. The reaction that produces this phosphodiester linkage is a condensation reaction that requires enzymes and ATP. The hydrogen atom bound to the oxygen on the 3' sugar carbon is removed, as is a hydroxyl group bound to the phosphate atom. These removed atoms combine into a water molecule while the oxygen atom on the 3' prime carbon of one nucleotide now bonds with the phosphate atom of an adjacent nucleotide. Okay, so that was kind of a lot of information that I just threw at you really quickly. 
So let me kind of break it down a little bit. DNA and RNA are nucleic acids. They're biopolymers that are composed of sequences of four different kinds of nucleotides. The nucleotides bind together through a condensation reaction to form phosphodiester linkages, involving the phosphate group and the sugar molecule of each adjacent nucleotide. The complementary pairing of bases in two nucleotide strands is called Watson-Crick pairing. A DNA molecule is very stable because of the fact that its two strands are held together with this huge zipper of hydrogen bonds. RNA, on the other hand, is less stable, because RNA is just a single-stranded molecule, and it possesses a relatively reactive hydroxyl group on its, on its sugar. Anyway, uh, back to DNA. In order to access the information that's been encoded in the CGAT sequences of DNA, an enzyme called DNA helicase needs to come through and unzip the DNA strand by breaking all of these hydrogen bonds. I'll discuss this in greater detail as well in future episodes about DNA replication, but for now I'm just going to stick with the structure and the basic functions of the nucleic acid molecules. Alright, so now it's been established that the backbone is a repeating sugar phosphate pattern. This pattern gives the molecule a particular characteristic, called directionality. One end of the nucleic acid molecule has a ribose sugar with an intact hydroxyl group. It hasn't been broken down yet in the condensation reaction to, bond, to bind to another nucleotide. This end with the hydroxyl group is called the 3' prime end, because it's named after the 3' prime carbon that this hydroxyl group attaches to. Now the other end of the molecule, and the other end of the nucleic acid chain entirely, is a phosphate group attached to the 5' prime end of the ribose sugar. So this end is called the 5' prime end. In cells, new nucleotide bases are only added to the 3' prime end. So when you're writing out a DNA sequence, one generally writes it in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. Each strand of DNA is antiparallel. This means that if you were to lay out a DNA molecule flat on the ground, the 5' prime to 3' prime directionality of one strand would run in the left to right direction, while the directionality of the other strand, of the complementary strand when placed in a complementary position, would then actually run in the right to left direction. Each double stranded DNA molecule is about 2 nanometers wide, or 2 billionths of a meter. That's really small, like 100,000 times thinner than a human hair small. The distance between each nucleotide base is 0.34 nanometers. And what's pretty interesting is that every 10 bases, or every 3.4 nanometers, the DNA helix has one full rotation. The DNA molecule is twisted into a helix for several reasons. The hydrogen bonds that are created in this anti-parallel complementary pairing, they contort the strands into a helix shape. Additionally, the hydrophobic nature of the nitrogenous bases encourages a helix shape in an aqueous solution so as to minimize, as much as possible, contact with polar water molecules. The sugar phosphate backbone, however, is not hydrophobic, and it will readily interact with and dissolve in water. This double-stranded, hydrogen-bond-sealed helix makes DNA an amazingly stable molecule. Its lack of a hydroxyl group makes it much less reactive than RNA, and this increases its durability. DNA stability also makes it an ideal storage vessel for hereditary information. However, on its own, DNA cannot replicate itself. DNA cannot catalyze any reactions. In order to replicate, DNA requires a whole suite of proteins to come and help it. Because of this, it's believed that DNA evolved after RNA. Because unlike DNA, RNA can actually catalyze the reactions in the protein suite that are necessary to replicate itself. What is it about RNA that gives it this ability? Where DNA lacks a hydroxyl group, RNA possesses one. This hydroxyl group on the end of RNA makes it much more reactive, and this reactivity allows RNA to participate in, for example, condensation reactions. 
The nucleotide bases on RNA, which include A, C, and G, and U instead of T, can engage in complementary base pairing just like DNA, so it can loop back on itself and form little, short, double-stranded segments within the greater RNA structure. The nucleotide bases on RNA, which include uh, A, C, and G, and U instead of T, these can engage in complementary base pairing just like DNA. Unlike DNA, the single-stranded nature of RNA allows it to fold back on itself and bind its own complementary sequences together. The double-stranded sequences can twist into a helix just like DNA, and at the end they create what are called hairpin loops, where the DNA had to fold back on itself. When the RNA strand folds back around to bind with itself, it creates a sequence of unpaired bases that loop between the two paired sequences. This unpaired sequence is called a hairpin loop. Because the bases inside the loop are unpaired, and thus exposed, they can actually participate in other reactions, or bind with free-floating proteins. So this little loop with these little reactive components on the inside are kind of like tiny little molecular petri dishes that can engage in little controlled chemical reactions. It's pretty cool. Again, unlike DNA, RNA can also replicate itself. Loose nucleotide bases floating around the solution are attracted to the exposed bases of the single-stranded RNA. Through hydrogen bonding, these free-floating bases will pair to the bases on the RNA, which now becomes what's called the template strand. The sugar phosphate backbone will fuse together with phosphodiester linkages, creating a double-stranded RNA molecule. An enzyme, or just a good dose of heat, will break the hydrogen bonds, splitting the strands. As all of these free-floating nucleotides bind to complementary spots on the, on the template strand, their sugar phosphate backbone can fuse together with phosphodiester linkages, and this will create a double-stranded RNA molecule with the original template strand and this newly synthesized strand that was built off of it, which is complementary to it. Now, if you have an enzyme, like a DNA polymerase or RNA polymerase or whatever, or just a good dose of heat, this will come through and break all of the hydrogen bonds, and it'll split the strands. This newly synthesized RNA strand is complementary to the template strand. So if the newly synthesized strand were to be used as a template for another new complementary strand, then this second new strand would be identical to the original template. In this way, RNA can not just store information, it can also make rudimentary copies of itself. Although its reactivity and its susceptibility to degradation make it kind of subpar, it makes it a subpar format for long-term data storage. A long RNA molecule will behave kind of like a, a polypeptide, or like the tertiary structure of a polypeptide, in that it'll undergo folding. The RNA strand will fold into a particular configuration. It'll clump together like a protein to become an RNA protein equivalent called a ribozyme. The ribozyme is an RNA strand that's been folded up into a globular shape, with the capacity to catalyze other chemical reactions. So a ribozyme is like a nucleic acid enzyme. Ribozymes have been observed to catalyze the formation of peptide bonds and phosphodiester linkages, among many other types of reactions. If RNA molecules can catalyze the formation of bonds critical to proteins and to the bonds in their own sugar phosphate backbones, then it's highly likely that RNA molecules might have been able to replicate themselves. This is why many biologists believe that RNA might have been the first self-reproducing biomolecule to exist. It would then stand to reason that DNA evolved from RNA as a more stable, long-term storage mechanism for hereditary information. These hypotheses about the first self-replicating biomolecules have led many researchers to study RNA and ribozymes to see if they can find one such molecule that's capable of directly reproducing itself. In experiments that study the chemical evolution of nucleic acids, researchers induced various mutations in a group of RNA molecules, and exposed them to free nucleotides. 
any RNA molecule that was able to catalyze phosphodiester linkages between the free nucleotides would then start to surround itself with growing pools of short little RNA sequences, using its own nucleotide sequences as a template. The RNA molecules that exhibited this replicative behavior were isolated and themselves replicated, which created a new generation of RNA molecules that had both a sensitivity to self-replication and a whole new group of mutations to study. These mutations could make the replicative capacity of the RNA molecules better or worse, and the better ones were again isolated and replicated. In this way, through generation after generation, the researchers grew RNA molecules that were undergoing a form of artificial selection. These experiments, however, only succeeded in creating RNA molecules about 10% the length of the ribozyme. Creating a longer RNA molecule has proved to be significantly more difficult than expected. This unsolved problem in biochemistry has led some researchers to doubt the hypothesis that a ribozyme was the first self-replicating molecule. This isn't to say that it's impossible, just that they think it's unlikely. The obnoxious truth of the matter is that, for the time being, we just don't really know for sure what molecules existed in the primordial soup. We don't really know what level of sophistication existed among the early RNA molecules. In modern cells across virtually all organisms, ribozymes are involved in the construction of proteins. Now this suggests, at the very least, an order of descent in the primordial soup. RNA most likely preceded proteins, because RNA helps the construction of proteins. Consider the conditions of the early Earth that I mention so often. The genesis of organic molecules seems to occur in energetic places, places that are exposed to heat, energy, gases, and mineral substrates. Deep-sea vents are one such place. Boiling, sulfur, or iron-rich gases perpetually soak the mineral-encrusted interior of the vents. This supplies a constant stream of chemical and thermal energy to the organic molecules within the vent, namely nucleic acids and proteins. For cells to exist independently of this constant energy stream, they needed a way to store energy such that it could be transported and used later. Without these energy-storing molecules, the first cells couldn't have lived for very long outside the warm mineral walls of their deep-sea vent. The solution to this problem came with the evolution of a particular class of molecules called carbohydrates, which I'll explore in further detail in the next episode. But for now, that is it for episode 4. I hope you learned something cool about nucleic acids, and I hope you're inspired to do a little more research on your own into RNA and DNA and all kinds of nucleotides and all this cool stuff. I did mention several things in this podcast that require a lot more explanation. Stuff like transcription, translation, and DNA replication, which will all be covered in future episodes. But for the time being, thanks for listening. Would you like to support the Biological Podcast? It's super easy. When you open a new episode, press the like button and share it with your friends. If you aren't subscribed, you should hit the subscribe button so you can enjoy a new episode every week. You can also peruse our official store, which has a ton of cool stuff like hand-designed t-shirts, hoodies, and stickers. All the links you need are in the description section below.